Hello, I'm John Storey, Director of Law and Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs and host of Australia Censored. Uh, today, my guest is my colleague, John Roskam, Senior Fellow and the former Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs. Welcome to the show, John. Hello, John. John, you've got a great uh, substack called One and Free, which is compulsory reading. Um, uh, we get your your great insights on a range of important matters. And I, and I was reading a, an edition recently um, where you quoted the following comment. Make a list of all the things you believe but can't say, then a list of the things you don't believe but must say. And that really resonated with me. And it also reminded me of a comment I heard recently from American sort of podcast host Matt Walsh who observed that the old schoolyard saying, don't tell me what to do, it's a free country, which I remember saying that as a kid or hearing it in the schoolyard. He said, kids are perceptive. They don't say it anymore. They don't, they don't say, well, I live in a free country. Um, I thought that was a good way to, to, to kick off. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where the basic freedoms to say and think whatever you please, don't feel like rights anymore. There were a couple of things that happened. John, I remember years ago we used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, <laughs> but names will never hurt me. I remember that. I don't think uh, anyone under 20 would be repeating that these days. A few things have happened. As Ronald Reagan said, every generation has to fight for its own freedoms to maintain liberty. And what has happened is we have assumed that the battles for freedom have been won, that we can rest on our laurels and that our rights are assured. That is not the case. In Australia, we have seen attempts at press censorship over 200 years defeated, but they come back. No sooner had... For example, the Gillard government's attempts to regulate the media being defeated, then the coalition itself was talking about media censorship and social media control, which we'll come to. The same applies to what we might say as individuals, to what we might say around the kitchen table. So um, uh, that's one thing. Two governments have new technologies, new capacity to control and manage what we say and the importance of freedom of speech is that what we say ultimately influences what we think and we saw some of that control in evidence during COVID. And then thirdly, there's been a massive psychological change in uh, Western society and Western culture whereby uh, victimhood is now being uh, presented as virtuous and when I would have said something about sticks and stones 20 or 30 years ago it was to demonstrate that I'm my own person and I make my own conclusions mm. and words can't hurt me. Now we understand words or the claim is words can hurt, words of violence, we need safe spaces uh, and none of this is good for freedom. So there hasn't been one single thing that's happened. There's been a range of things that have occurred at the same time. Yeah, even the, the one that I led with, um, I live in a free country, is, it's an assertion of rights and autonomy, you can't control me, whereas now the rejoinder would more likely be you can't say that or you can't do that because you're being racist or you're offending me. Or And, and or, we assumed you know. that we lived in a free country um, until the COVID lockdowns mm. uh, and it controlled not just our um, physical activities um, but what we could say, what we could debate. We had the influence of intelligence services around the world and just recently we're now getting to the bottom of what happened in Trudeau's Canada. Mm. Um, we are getting to the bottom of what happened in the United States, in the UK. Hopefully we'll come to understand uh, what occurred here in Australia. And I think every time that we uh, have our liberties attacked, uh, we become a little bit desensitised mm -hmm. to what has occurred as well. And we've been, become desensitised as a, as a community and we can see that in polls whereby 
fewer and fewer young people are believing in the basic concepts because they haven't been told about them and they haven't uh, had experience of them. It's a frog, the boiling frog. The boiling, phenomenon. the yeah. boiling frog. But the other thing is that we understand is that when you mount an argument for freedom and when you talk about real life examples of why freedom matters, um, the, the temperature on the uh, stove can be turned down. Mm. Boiling doesn't have to be inevitable. Mm. You, you alluded to it um, briefly that it, it's, it's over history, different sides of politics, governments of different persuasions have all dabbled in censorship or wanted to, for whatever motivation, wanted to control the narrative, control the press, control what people say. Um, but increasingly recently, it seems like it has become a polarised issue that the, the strongest proponents of censorship tend to be on what you might call the political left and those that are willing to, 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 to shout and claim freedom of speech are on the political right. This, as I said, this hasn't always been the case. You just you go back to the early um, 2000s where it was a Republican president, George W. Bush, imposing the Patriot Act and, and, and new sort of con new controls that the political left were outraged about. So I'm not suggesting this is... Well, it feels to me it's not necessarily something innate in the, in, in the political debate. But why is it now such a polarised... I think that's one of the key questions of modern politics, of modern ideology. When did we go from the left defending freedom mm. and freedom of speech and freedom of conscience, conscience to the left now imposing a totalitarianism upon us? And you mentioned uh, George Bush. We can go back to the 1960s where the left were fighting for freedom. You can go back to the 1780s. You can go back to the 1640s and the... English Revolution, and I think there's a couple of things that went on. This is not necessarily a left-right thing. It is a totalitarian, authoritarian view of the world versus a view of individual freedom. And I think what we saw was the left, in an attempt to gain power, starting in the 1960s in modern times, um, adopted the mantra of freedom to gain control to gain power and I've written about this but it was only ever mm. about maintaining authority and now that the left has gained authority the causes that it once espoused that it campaigned for that it was out in the streets for um, have been abandoned mm. and I think it reveals a couple of things one is as I've said that freedom of speech is not a left or right Thing because, as you said, both sides have at various times supported it and not supported it, but it also reveals the hollowness of the left and that ultimately um, freedom of speech is with people uh, who today we might simply call classical liberals, liberal in a way that allows us to speak and think and debate freely without the government or anyone else telling us what to do and what to think. You also uh, mentioned early, earlier the change in technology. Um, that's, I think that's why um, freedom of speech has become a more important issue because it's, it's, it's more achievable. I mean, you, 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 the, the, the systems, the technology for monitoring what we say, where we go, um, even with new algorithms, they can determine what you think almost, almost before that. You know, they know what you're going to purchase and who you're probably going to vote for, maybe more than we do as ourselves. Which is why I think there's been a concerted global push for internet censorship. Um, if you can control the internet, you control the modern town square. And we saw... In uh, the recent, and you control, and you do more than control the town square. You control individuals and their human interactions. Exactly. Absolutely. Whether whether in a town square, whether to a dozen of your friends, or whether it's five thousand subscribers to a blog, or a hundred thousand or a million people reading a yeah. news outlet. Yeah, and that to me would if if you're 
if you're inclined to think that people shouldn't just say whatever they want to say, um, people's feelings need to be taken into account, we need to acknowledge the dangers of, you know, of, of, of people saying the wrong thing or pushing bad ideas. If you're inclined to, to think that way, which we've sort of said is probably the way the modern left thinks more than the modern right, then control of the internet is a holy grail. If you can control that, you can silence the ideas you don't like, you can promote the ideas you, you do like. And to me, that seems to be behind this push. It's a global push. We'll get to Australia in a second. But the World Economic Forum in Davos recently, they listed their top 10 um, global risks for the next two years. Now, bearing in mind, we've just had a spate of new wars. We've just come off the back of a, a global pandemic. And of course, um, everyone's always screaming about climate change. But none of them were the top risk. It was disinformation and misinformation with the objective of pushing policymakers around the world to embrace um, internet regulations that would force social media companies to take down misinformation. And of course, Australia, sadly ahead of the curve on this issue, already last year introduced new so-called misinformation laws that would do exactly that. It would empower ACMA, to um, punish social media companies if they allow disinformation and misinformation to, to, to spread on their, on their platforms. Is that a, a fair summary of why there's this sudden push for these misinformation laws is because get control of the internet, um, you've got control of the people? That's a very good way of putting it. Um, it's about controlling the peasants' revolt. Mm. Um, what the internet and social media has allowed us to do is talk to each other, mm. talk to large groups of people, um, avoiding the traditional channels, mm. avoiding mainstream media or using it as appropriate but not exclusively, avoiding government channels and speaking direct without an intermediary. So that is a potentially hugely liberating force, but it is very, very challenging to the powers that be. And that technology that allows us to do that is also now a technology that can be used by the governments or government agencies to shut down debate. So um, we have the two sides of the same coin. We have the potential flourishing of discussion, flourishing of debate, the capacity for individuals to come to their own conclusions, to do their own research. Mm. And when you're talking about the concerns of groups like the WEF, the last thing they want is citizens coming to their own conclusions and uh, deciding uh, what might be real or not real. But then the flip side of the capacity to have this big debate is that the government has the capacity and the media and technology companies have the capacity to shut it down. Mm. And uh, at the same time as this is happening, you have a decline in trust in the government, a decline in trust in mainstream media, and governments in the mainstream media saying, oh, lo and behold, we will build trust by censoring <laughs> what people can say and imposing ever more controls. Now, the question will be, is the genie out of the bottle? You can't uninvent the printing press. You can't uninvent the biro pen. Um, I think it probably is. I hope it is. Um, and this poses very big challenges for governments. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's not a simplistic argument, uh, a simplistic issue in that, I mean, even conservatives, traditionalists, would worry about pornography and, and child exploitation and things and how readily they are spread on social media and online. Um, it is something that that complete freedom to communicate you can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world with the devices we've got in our pockets. Touch right? my button. Yeah, touch but my I, button. I, I think it is simple. Um, there's always been, well, in modern times, there's uh, been laws against 
pornography exposure of children to inappropriate images. There has been legislation against incitement to violence, uh, threats to physical safety. These principles don't change. What we mm. have seen is mm. that under the guise of protection mm. of children, to take an example, mm. uh, the uh, media regulation is then expanded. We first had uh, eight, Section 18C um, in the Racial Discrimination Act was introduced by a Labor government to control incitement to violence. It was used against conservative commentators. It was used against Andrew Bolt, who was threatened against the great cartoonist who's sadly no longer with mm. us, Bill Leake. Um, it was used against a number of students at the Queensland University of Technology who were simply making a passing comment on Facebook uh, that in a colourblind society there shouldn't be uh, Indigenous-only computer labs. So um, <laughs> I am not willing to concede the argument that communication is now necessarily more complex mm. uh, than it once was. I, I see it as an issue of, of trust. Um, there was probably a time where in Australia and, and across the West that you probably felt you could trust your government to, say, regulate something like pornography or, or something that seems a pretty objectively um, you know, what's happening, you know, or, or, or you know, bullying of children or, or incitement to violence. But it just seems that that trust in institutions has, has evaporated for very good reasons because oh. we've seen these institutions, the bracket creep, the, 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 the scope creep of, as you said, you know, Oh, we need a regulator of the internet to, to, to get down the, the child exploitation. It's, it's soon being used, the same laws or the same bureaucracy. Against COVID. Is, is used against COVID, some other health thing. And then, you know, health mechanisms are used for climate lockdowns. And, and so there's just this feeling of, look, I understand there's some bad stuff on the internet, but I don't trust you to regulate it because I know that's just going to mean silencing conservative viewpoints. So it's better to be a free free for all because at least that's better than a government. And I don't I don't see it as a question of the people trusting the government to regulate. Um, I see it more as a little while ago the government was able to reflect community mores and standards mm. uh, and broad community standards. What is happening now, and we've seen it in all walks of life and all walks of policy, increasingly the state is not reflecting broad community values, mm. broadly accepted, conventional and long-established values. It is following a minority viewpoint, and I think that is part of the difference. So if the government is... Um, imposing or developing or creating broad community standards, then it would do so very uh, sparingly. It would do so carefully and it wouldn't, it wouldn't change the rules very often because community values don't change mm. uh, that much uh, in a short space of time. But what is happening now is um, the government is regulating on behalf of a minority and that is a problem. That's why uh, one of the reasons why trust in government is declining. So this idea um, that we can trust the government, as a, the libertarian in me would say that we can't trust the government to do much at all and we can't trust the government um, to regulate our speech when the government is so self-interested in the regulation of speech. Yeah, it seems to me I, I'm struck by the brazenness of the timing. I mean, I... The idea that governments want to control what we say and control the internet and control the narrative, that doesn't surprise me. That's been around for a few <laughs> thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Government overreach yeah. and government wanting to control their people is, mm. is what the entire liberal project <laughs> was about. It's not a new thing. But to push for it right now just seems to be... It, it's almost... It's almost a... a like they're testing what they can get away well, with. Well, there's a few things happening. Um, governments and government officials are making ambit claims mm. um, and that's what governments so often do. 
governments haven't traditionally had any pushback uh, or much pushback to their attempts. Uh, I think that the capacity to use technology has emboldened governments and they governments themselves don't know yet what they can get away with. Yeah. And we have, I think, a community that is almost shocked into sullenness mm. um, and feels powerless to push back, um, especially in our political system when you had, let's take the misinformation bill, when you had it proposed by the Liberal Party, mm. by the coalition, yeah. under Scott Morrison, and now taken further by the Labor government. So if you vote for one of the two mainstream mm. sides of politics, what do you do? There's yeah. no one saying enough is enough. It's good that the coalition has finally come around to understanding how terrible their first proposals were. But there's been absolutely no acknowledgement that the coalition had this idea in the first place. There was no acknowledgement that this got as far as a statement from a coalition minister. There was no acknowledgement uh, that anyone in the coalition party room stood up and said, no. It seems that no one in the cabinet said no to this. It's as if it hasn't happened. And until the coalition understands just how bad and appalling their position has been on freedom of speech for such a long mm. time, they're not going to be able to get any ground to speak up for Australians who believe in freedom of thought and freedom of speech. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that it's felt for a while that it doesn't matter... Well, we, we famously had for. Scott Morrison. Well, it doesn't matter who we vote for, and Scott Morrison uh, famously said, well, freedom of speech doesn't create a single job. So yeah. this coming from a senior spokesperson for the party that was meant to defend our freedoms. Yeah, I mean, it was terrible. So you ask me, terrible. where have our freedoms gone? Well, they can be summed up in that sentence from Scott Morrison. Yeah, and, and to get back to the timing, though, as I said, you know, Government's grabbing power. We've, we've done this dance before yeah. and there'll be many more to come. But on, on this specific issue, um, when in recent years governments and institutions, when it's come to trying to silence opposing views for some public policy reason, whether it's, you know, COVID or or election integrity in, in, in the United States or a range of issues. Or the voice here the, in the, Australia. They get it wrong and quite quickly proven to be wrong. Everything, the Wuhan lab that couldn't possibly have come from there, now that's the orthodox uh, uh, viewpoint. It's, it just seems to be that on so many issues, the government's view or the, the mainstream view proves quite quickly to be wrong and to then at this time of all times when it's like you guys have just gotten so much wrong so recently, we all remember it, we were locked, lockdowns were only a few years ago, um, to have gotten it so wrong so recently to now say, well, the solution that we propose to misinformation is to create a government agency that will be able to, to determine what the truth of the matter is and, and dictate what social media says. It's just so brazen. But it, it, it's... Brazen for exactly the way you described it, which is as governments and technology have allowed us to prove governments wrong mm. or inaccurate or manipulative, it is precisely because we can now do that that governments now have turbocharged their attempts to control what we can say mm. about government. When um, government scandals... Uh, when government misfeasance um, had to be channelled. Uh, the news about it was channelled through the mainstream media. Governments and the mainstream media had a method of control that the governments now don't have. So it is because governments are losing control that they are now so brazen about getting back control. They are cause and effect. And, and that to me is the huge danger in that if you, perceive, rightly or wrongly, if you perceive there to be a problem, people get hurt by the free expression of ideas, minorities or whatever. If you perceive that to be a problem, 
A hundred years ago, the solution didn't need to be, you use the word totalitarian. So a hundred years ago, the way you communicated people was, well, within face-to-face by a written letter or maybe a telegraph. And there was only so many newspapers. So if you were the, you know, if you were the dictatorial type, you didn't need to be do too much to, to silence. You could that. ring three or four media proprietors. You could you, you could regulate you know, the newspapers. It, you, there used to be in the you know, Tsarist Russia, they would read mm. every letter. Mm. They'd read them, mm. or at least the ones that are going from suspected people to suspected people, and they could, you know, no, you've said the wrong thing and and whatever. But you didn't have to get into people's daily lives, understand what they're doing. You didn't have to get into their house to be able to, to do that. Because communication systems are so free, to regulate them requires quite extreme measures yes. in order to, well, you can't say that. They've got to really delve into literally your private lives. I know it's online, but because our private lives are online. And I said that's what people, I think, don't quite grasp the, the danger. It's not quite the same as... You know, giving the newspapers a slap on the wrist if they print something, it's, they it's probably the, should. This is... You, you look yeah. at it and this is um, precedents being set around the world, whether it's legislation discussed in Scotland, legislation in Ireland. People don't understand um, that governments are seeking to not just regulate but control and then prosecute uh, on the basis of a private text message between two people that was never intended for public broadcast, mm. that was never intended to be seen by anyone other than the recipient of the message. This is what the state is now planning to mm. do, and in some countries they are well on the way to doing it. The idea that you should have the police, as now happens in the UK under uh, their Telecommunications Act, that the police would come and knock on your door um, because of an email that you sent to one recipient uh, is would have been a few years ago absolutely abhorrent, mm. but somehow now we accept it. Yeah, I, I think the Irish hate crime bill that's being proposed, merely having hateful material on your device, on your phone... That you might not even send you to might, anyone. You might not even send to send any, anyone, intend to send to anyone, merely possessing it. So there might have been a meme that's a bit insensitive but you found it funny and you save it on your device. That is enough. I and, mean, this is And when you talk to... about governments being brazen, they are so brazen that almost the citizenry is frozen into inaction because it is so dangerous it's hard to comprehend. And, again, we're talking about political parties not standing for freedom. The UK Tories are not less bad mm. than what is happening in Ireland at the moment, for example. So yeah. uh, it is the minor parties, it is the micro parties that are more likely to be standing up for freedom of speech than the uh, two major sides of politics at the moment. Looking forward, it's been a bit depressing so far, to, to be honest. I think you're right. I think the root cause is... If you, if you don't defend these freedoms, you, you, you'll lose them. They, they, I think that is the root cause. And for too long, the centre-right hasn't been willing to fight. They haven't been willing to... The centre-right never thought it would get this bad. Yeah. Well, I... we'll let them do this, but it'll never come to that. Well, within a few years, it does come to that. That's the yeah. story of totalitarianism. Well... I never thought it would happen to me. Well, it is now happening. And by the time you realise where it's got to, it's too late. And, and look, I mean, just the, some of the, the optics, I don't want to weigh into the, 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 the politics of the Gaza war, but just the optics of some of the things that we're seeing and some of the things that are being said on public streets every weekend. Um, it's like... But this know, is the left seeking control, so... Famous, I've referred to famous Section 18C that is uh, intended to control um, uh, discussion about race that intimidates or humiliates. Uh, it has been used against conservatives. It's not used against hate preachers. Mm. It's not used against people shouting evil things in the streets. So, again, this is not actually about 
hate. It is not actually about uh, incitement to racial vilification. It is about control. It is some speech that we will allow because it is of a political viewpoint that we might agree with. And uh, on the other side, there are arguments that say, well, it's said by a conservative, but it might be completely mild, it might be completely innocuous, but that has to be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's hugely significant that Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, as far as we know, hasn't yet been used by any, against any hate preacher. Yeah. Yeah. It's it has quite been extraordinary. used against university students who said Australia should be a colour blind country. And I note that the New South Wales government are reviewing their, their um, incitement, hate incitement laws. And I had a read of them. I was asked to comment on it on, on the news. And if this legislation as it stands can't already be used That's right. to, to silence this, they're talking about more police powers. It's like, oh, we've seen this. Oh, yeah, we need more police powers to stop this. In five years' time, those police powers are going to be used against the right. <laughs> That's right. And, and the risk is we're going to end up with de facto uh, bigotry laws. Yeah. You're not going to be able to say something about a religion for fear of offending someone. And, again, what we have to understand is um, some of what is said might be offensive. Mm. Absolutely might be. It might be hurtful. Um, but that is the price of living in a free society. You've been very generous with your time, John. Um, I thought we'd just finish up on this point. Um, you've, been a, you've been a fighter in this space for, for, for decades, um, freedom of speech and, and other issues. <sighs> Give us your concluding thoughts. Are you positive about the future or pessimistic? No, you have to be posit positive. You have to be optimistic about um, the future. You have to be realistic about the challenges ahead and you have to be realistic that political parties uh, will not always fight for freedom. Um, but the desire to speak your mind is a very strong one. It is innate, it is necessary to human flourishing, um, and it only needs one person to be able to think freely and to be honest and to be able to communicate that to bring down a totalitarian regime. So one of my favourite authors is, is George Orwell, and in 1984, this is one of the themes that Orwell talks about. It takes but one person to be able to, free, to think freely, to keep the flame of freedom alive, and I think there will always not just be one person but many. So we have many challenges, um, and it might be that in the short run we um, don't succeed as much as we would like, um, but in the long run I am optimistic about the future. Yeah, a lot of people... Uh are using all well as comparisons. Uh, 1984. I prefer Animal Farm. I think the the pigs are in charge, and as one set of rules applies to them, and another for the rest of us. I think finishing on a bit of all well is a is a great way to finish. John, thank thanks for your time, and thanks for all you do and have done over many years to promote freedom of speech. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm.